Hello again, everybody. Welcome to case study number 22. This will be a patient with watery diarrhea. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the i button on the upper right hand corner. I really appreciate all the support I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. So thank you very much in advance for your consideration and especially those of you who have already uh, contributed. All right, so we got a 19-year-old African-American man presenting to the clinic complaining of having six to seven episodes of diarrhea every day. Now, patients will come in and they'll say, I have diarrhea. Well, there's actually a definition for diarrhea, and that's typically uh, understood as watery stools. But really what we mean by that is more than three stools per day. Now, typically that's going to be watery uh, or um, loose in consistency. Uh, remember that the normal amount of stools uh, is going to be three per week to three per day. All right, now that that's aside, let's continue. He describes the diarrhea as watery and very light brown. He's distressed because he has to wake up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. He's tried over-the-counter antidiarrheals, but they have not helped. He says that the episodes of diarrhea are accompanied by lower abdominal pain and severe flatulence. He also endorses belching more than usual. He works as a swimming instructor at the community pool. He drinks socially, but does not smoke or use recreational drugs. He's got no significant past medical history. He denies travel outside the U.S. and denies sick contacts. Always important to know with a diarrhea history. And he is sexually active with one female partner and uses condoms regularly. He's on no medications, vitals, blood pressure 94 over 61, heart rate 110, respiration is 13, temperature 97, satting 100% on room air. So we notice from his vitals that he is probably a little dehydrated, not unusual in a patient with diarrhea. Let's go ahead and do our physical exam. So general, he's ill-appearing, eyes sunken, skin, mild pallor, mildly decreased turgor, no rashes. This is pointing to dehydration. Uh, H-E-N-T is fine, no lymphadenopathy, cleared auscultation, uh, no murmurs. Uh, he's got hyperactive bowel sounds and uh, the rectal exam, which is always important to do anytime you've got a patient with GI issues. Um, we see a small amount of watery stool that is occult negative. So he's got non-bloody, non-bloody, acute diarrhea. Now, what do we know about acute diarrhea? Acute diarrhea is less than two weeks. Um, then we've got persistent, which is two to four weeks and chronic, which is more than a month. So this is acute diarrhea. So our differential includes infectious causes. That should always be considered in acute diarrhea because it is the most common. Now, there are a lot of infectious causes. Um, viral, bacterial, and parasitic are the most common, respectively. Um, then we have to think of the possibility of C. diff colitis. Most people associate that with antibiotics, but it can happen in people who aren't on antibiotics. Then we've got some of the more chronic causes. Now, could this be somebody with chronic diarrhea who's just presenting early? Possibly, but we should exclude the infectious causes first. And so that is indeed what we're going to do, but not before we bolus him because he is dehydrated. CCS is going to want you to know that when you've got a patient who is unstable, not looking good, something we can fix, like fluids, that you want to do that first. Okay, we're going to get a CBC and a BMP, and then most importantly, we're going to get stool studies. So that includes, most importantly, leukocytes, ovum parasites, and then these, um, these antigen toxin assays looking for specific causes, namely Giardia and C. diff, and then we culture. Now, culture is not going to come back right away, but this is going to give you some good hints. Leukocytes will tell you if you have an enteroinvasive cause or if, you have, if you're talking about more chronic diarrheas, uh, if you've got an inflammatory diarrhea. So, for instance, it'll never be positive. You'll never have white cells in, in the, the feces 
uh, if you're dealing with irritable bowel syndrome. You're never going to have it if you're dealing with viral gastroenteritis. You're never going to have it if you're dealing with uh, one of those preformed toxins like from Staph aureus or Bacillus. Uh, but you will have it if you have an enteroinvasive cause like Campylobacter, Shigella, or if you've got uh, inflammatory bowel disease or something like that. Ova and parasites will come up if you've got a, a parasitic cause naturally. So primarily here we're thinking of Giardia, uh, but you could also um, possibly, it's not the best test, but sometimes you can see it in other causes uh, as well, which I'm not going to get into, but I'm thinking like Cryptosporidium. Uh, so Giardia antigen is certainly the most specific for Giardia, and C. diff is going to be the most specific for C. diff. So what do we find? CBC within normal limits. BMP shows uh, this, um, which I'm not going to go into, but notice the BUN and creatinine are both elevated. If you do the math there, you'll find that this is, in fact, pre-renal azotemia. And that makes sense because he's dehydrated. A stool studies show cysts and trophozoites uh, and a positive Giardia antigen. Ergo, we can make the diagnosis of giardiasis with secondary AKI, which we have tended to with the fluids. The treatment for giardiasis has changed. It is now tinidazole. It used to be metronidazole. Metronidazole is now second line. Um, so tinidazole is the antibiotic of choice for the treatment of giardiasis. Nidazoxanide can also be used. It's, it's also very effective, so you can go with that. Um, but I would go with tinidazole because it's easy to remember because it's like metronidazole, which we used to use. It's tinidazole. Uh, Peromomycin would be given in pregnant patients. So if this were a female patient, you would do a pregnancy test before giving tinidazole. If she is, in fact, pregnant, you would give her peromomycin. Remember to re replete the fluids until the blood pressure normalizes, and then we're going to do counseling, adequate hydration, that's important, Pedialyte, Gatorade, etc. Side effects of the medication, avoid milk. With, GR, with giardiasis, you can get a transient uh, lactose intolerance, so avoid milk for one month after the, medic, uh, after the, uh, the giardiasis resolves, and then reassurance. So giardiasis is a parasitic infection of the intestines and a very common cause of infectious diarrhea in the U.S. Transmission is fecal-oral, usually waterborne. This guy is a swimming instructor, and they usually instruct kids. Kids are dirty little creatures. So, um, you know, that's a that's a uh, an easy way to, to get this. Um, classically, you hear about it in camping, but that's kind of a dead giveaway. The stool is usually described as watery or greasy, but it is never, ever bloody. Bloating and belching is also common. This is kind of a malabsorptive diarrhea, so it's kind of separate in that it's like an acute malabsorptive diarrhea, kind of like, you know, what you would expect with something like, um, you know, uh, uh, chronic pancreatitis or uh, celiac disease, but it's acute, and it'll give you ova and parasites. It is self-limited, but we do give antibiotics because it shortens the course. Um, there are various risk factors. Uh, a positive ova and parasite or a positive GRD antigen is diagnostic. Treatment is tinidazole. The nice thing about that is you only have to give a single dose. If you were to give nidazoxanide, you have to give it for a few days. Metronidazole, we had to give it for a week. So tinidazole is nice, single dose. Major problem is dehydration. Remember to keep those fluids up. And the patient should be advised to avoid dairy products for a month. These are your common differentials. Remember here, we're mostly thinking about these acute causes, which tend to be infectious. Don't worry about getting things like Sudan stain and uh, and things like osmotic gap. The latter is more for chronic diarrhea. So um, when you're dealing with an acute diarrhea, it's kind of a game of figure out what infection you're dealing with. Uh, lactose intolerance, certainly something you want to think of with a chronic intermittent diarrhea, very common, number one cause of chronic diarrhea in the United States. Um, and so there are a number of other causes, but we were dealing with an acute diarrhea here, which helped us limit it down. These are your various causes of acute diarrhea. Notice that infectious causes make up the majority. Also notice, uh, according to this figure, that viral causes tend to be a little bit more mild and protozoal causes tend to be a little bit more um, significant. So uh, to recap, acute diarrhea is a diarrhea that lasts for fewer than 14 days. It is usually infectious. Viral is most common. 
Chronic diarrhea is more than four weeks, and the causes are more diverse. Patients presenting with acute diarrhea should first be evaluated for hydration status, and that should be attended to ASAP. Stool studies should be done to ascertain the cause. Most forms of acute diarrhea are self-limited, but we really look for giardiasis and C. diff because those are the infectious causes that we would, in fact, treat. Make sure to counsel patients regarding adequate fluid intake, as I have said, ad nauseum. Giardiasis is a common cause of acute diarrhea in those exposed to untreated or contaminated water the stool is watery, greasy, and accompanied by severe flatulence, bloating, and belching, and it is never, ever bloody. The treatment is tinnitusol and to avoid milk products for a month.